good afternoon um, and welcome to this panel on what we teach when we teach DH. Um, my name is Diane Jakaki. I'm from Bucknell University. My co-chair and co-author is Brian Croxell from <laughs> Brigham Young University. Um, and we're very happy to have you here this afternoon. Um, the way we're going, well, I will, I will read the introduction and it will be self-evident, apparently. Um, there are many different digital humanities pedagogies as there are people who teach digital humanities. Indeed, we have the data to prove it. During summer 2019, we conducted an international survey of DH pedagogues asking them about their teaching practices. We launched that survey at the DH 2019 DH Con we launched that survey at the D 2019 DH conference at Utrecht, uh, and it ran for approximately 60 days following the conference. At the time, we had planned on presenting the results of the survey at the 2020 DH conference in Ottawa, but as you all know, the world went a bit sideways with the COVID-19 pandemic. The, re the results were, in the end, published. Um, as a presentation in the core repository of Humanities Commons, and I would read the DOI, but that would not be helpful. Um, one of the questions that we asked the 340 people who completed the survey was the name of their current academic institution. 256 respondents answered this question, which allowed us to identify where they were working. And we quickly discovered that 68% of the respondents were in the US, 20% were in Europe, and 8% were in Canada. Only 3.5% of our respondents, or N equals nine, were outside these three regions, which, to be on let's be honest, are kind of only two regions, um, North America and Europe. Um, our presentation for DH 2020 considers some of the reasons for this response in our to our survey and some ways that future surveys could be shaped to avoid this too limited perspective. At the same time that we were working on the survey, we were beginning the selection of the essays that would form, form our forthcoming uh, edited collection in the Debates in DH series, What We Teach When We Teach DH. Uh, look for it in finer uh, establishments in December of this year. This lack of rep representativeness in the survey led us to do what we could to ensure a broad range of perspectives on DH pedagogy from different regions of the globe. And that's what our panel offers today, where we have four presentations, one from Ireland, one from India, one from China, and one from the US, each with a clear focus on pedagogy. But these papers are more than just geographically distinct. They are also rooted in personal, specific ex experiences that point to the range of DH teaching, both the what and the where, that takes place around the world today. Such details make plain the positionality of our contributors who work in different institutions with different advantages and disadvantages. While in hindsight, we realized that the survey did not provide the kind of uh, eureka conclusions we might have assumed, it did reaffirm some of the expectations we had in developing the What We Teach When We Teach DH volume. First, that as long as there, uh, as long as there have been discussions about DH, what it is, who, it, who is doing it, um, who is in and who is out, um, there have been questions about the role of pedagogy within the field and yet quantifying in any way the who is doing it must remain elusive because the pedagogical experiences continue to change and shift. The students, their expectations, and the facilities they can access have changed. The instructors, their confidence, and the pedagogical environments have changed, not to mention their professional designations, infrastructure and support systems, and, institu and institutional expectations of them. The academy has changed radically too, but in a way, we think it is the teaching of DH that has changed most of all in the last 10 years. Um, we have asked uh, uh, each of our presenters today to draw on their chapters, but shorten them in what can be uh, shared in a maximum of about 12 minutes. Uh, that will then give us time, at least 20 minutes for discussion about uh, what we teach when we teach DH. So what I'll do is I'll introduce each of the, the presenters now um, together, and then they'll come up um, for each presentation um, so we won't interrupt their flow. 
Uh, our, first in, our first presenters are Le Kang Sui, um, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Chinese and History at the City University of Hong Kong and convener of the Digital Society Research Cluster there. He recently uh, received the Teaching Excellence Award from his university. Congratulations. Um, Jing Chen is Associate Professor in Art and Cultural Creativity at the School of Arts at Nanjing University. Nirmala Manan is a Professor and Research Lead of the Digital Humanities Research Group at IIT Indoor. Uh, she is also Chair of the newest, newly established J.P. Narayan uh, National Center of Excellence in the, humanity, in the Humanities. She mentors PhD students and directs P, uh, DH projects with postdoc fellows and research associates from her lab. She publishes, talks, and speaks about all things DH, and when stressed, bakes bread or gets a new CO uh, approved by ADHO, as, was, as happened yesterday. Um, James O'Sullivan, who will be representing on his behalf, lectures in digital humanities at University College Cork. Most recently, he edited the Bloomsbury Handbook um, to the Digital Humanities, and you can see jamesosullivan.org for more details. Um, Alison Langmead directs the Visual Media Workshop in the Department of History of Art and Architecture at the University of Pittsburgh, which uh, is a lab environment that investigates the mindful use of digital technologies within the context of visual and material cultural studies. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're really glad to be part of the panel and we look forward to the dis discussions about teaching DH. This is part and parcel to what we do and to the agendas that we push for. And our uh, presentation as well as the uh, chapter that we have written is a collaborative effort so that we cover enough of what we deem important in the DH pedagogical landscape in China. So as for myself, I was a postdoc in 2015 to 2018, responsible for uh, introducing and promoting the China Biographical Database and Digital Methods to China. And Ben Jun, um, in the middle, uh, a research librarian at uh, the foremost institution in China for the humanities, um, and as you will uh, uh, hear from me a little bit, um, library and information sciences is where a lot of the action takes place in China. But he could not be here, so I will um, uh, introduce his ideas for him. And CJ, um, who's here today, um, is an art school a faculty with many cultural heritage and collaborative projects. So I will do the talking for now, and CJ will join in uh, when we move on to our discussions and Q&A, just to show um, the edited volume, um, the cover of it uh, a little bit um, will be out in all good online bookstores um, soon. Um, and uh, the ideas that we present today uh, are mainly based on that uh, chapter. Um, and we uh, also uh, present some of the updates uh, from the field from 2020 to 2023. So in the past seven years or so, DH have been seen as the next big thing in the humanity circles in China. So of course, it's a huge country with 3,000 um, higher ed institutions, um, many of them providing graduate level teaching as well. And of course, you know, with its history, with its humanities data, there is a lot of demand, there is a lot of potential for teaching and learning DH there. But there is a but. The ecosystem for developing DH pedagogy um, has met challenges. And in our previous work, we charted how the time around 2009, uh, we begin to see the DH moment uh, taking off in China. But that's, despite these initiatives for over a decade, uh, the teaching of DH has not yet taken root in the formal curriculum within the proper institutional spaces, except for a very, very few um, places in China. So the question for us really um, is um, that we need to address, 
in China, how do we apply the interest and the demand for DH scholarship and learning, and especially to apply it to the classroom and other learning contexts. And of course, this requires us to understand the academic structures in China, which I will uh, say a little bit about, um, especially con configurations in higher ed in China. In the, the roles of DH teaching in general education or sort of liberal arts education and also in the interdisciplinary initiatives are with very, very different purposes in China's educational system. So the institutional configuration is this. The state policies towards uh, higher ed are largely arranged according to disciplines. The disciplinary boundaries are rather rigid. The resources are dictated by those uh, boundaries and um, disciplines. And especially from the uh, 2017 onwards, um, there's this thing called uh, the double first class. Um, and it's sort of a nationwide policy for Chinese universities that um, push for the strengthening of strong disciplines in universities. Um, and this, of course, has made it um, the landscape very competitive. Um, and resources still revol revolve around disciplines. And um, they're distributed by the state through these mechanisms. And therefore, um, one main challenge that we see in the teaching of DH in China would be this, the implementation of cross-disciplinary collaborations. Of course, it's integral, it's core to what we do as digital humanists, but it can create huge challenges also for scholars, for departments who are administering um, new DH courses. Resources usually need to be allocated to courses such as digital plus a discipline rather than a sort of DH course broadly defined or a methodological course in a certain subject. And another main challenge that we see is um, the lack of solid training in both the, sort of the tech side of things and the humanities side of things. So making it hard, naturally, um, for teachers and students to blend them in uh, their learning context and in classrooms. And in the article that uh, we have written for the book, we analyzed some of the efforts uh, by Ben Jun, um, and he had refined them over several years, um, and so we report our findings in the book how to strengthen these efforts, how we could uh, improve on blending the two in uh, these contexts. The third challenge that we see is the lack of uh, support, especially in the process of institutionalization. So we see um, centers, DH centers cropping up in more and more Chinese institutions, from less than a handful in 2017 to more than a dozen now. But many of these centers, we still see most of them without full-time staffing or dedicated uh, technical support uh, staff. And therefore, um, humanities scholars often find it pretty frustrating and difficult to do the kind of work that they, they start to have contact with when they read uh, DH journals, when they read books uh, in DH. And the, the um, main phenomena that we see, you know, the main action that we see in uh, Chinese uh, academia is that major Chinese libraries um, are the focal points for DH activity. And library and information science experts also offer most of the DH outputs. So we did a, an analysis of um, the DH papers. You know, this, this is pretty crude. It's just a statistical analysis of papers with the title um, DH, you know, Digital Humanities, Shu Zi Renwen in Chinese. But we see um, the number of outputs that dominate um, the papers are the main sort of active researchers in DH. And these are predominantly library and information science scholars or at least they are the ones who talk about DH explicitly. 
And this situation in research, of course, feeds into teaching and learning. So how are the teaching? How are they done? The teaching that we see in the country mainly lie in the flexible area, so the informal spaces in between institutional structures. The community itself is also an informal group. They are from different uh, universities across the country, from all sorts of departments. They have different kinds of backgrounds. They collaborate informally, usually. They, we have an online discussion um, regularly. But the teaching usually you know, takes this form of informal uh, settings. Um, they are usually in the form of ad hoc workshops or one-off talks uh, by uh, professors and visitors who have DH training. These were often the first point of contact that many of our students had um, with DH. Also, the role of international conferences um, from the 2010s onwards. It's a main sort of uh, occasion in which concepts in DH and skill sets spread, as with online networking and discussions. This we identify as a pretty good sort of pathway for grad students and early career scholars to gain training and contact with DH. But for undergrads, it's much more difficult for them to know these pathways and have the resources to do so, to reach out to these communities. Also, Parachuting, and by parachuting, we mean the teaching of DH you know, with uh, visitors uh, from foreign projects or international collaborators, so as to speak. Um, and, and Anna was among um, one of those who parachuted um, back then. Um, I was a postdoc, and I was sent to uh, mainland China for six months every year to promote DH and our database, the China Biographical Database, many of the uh, DH uh, practitioners um, working with Chinese data have worked with uh, CBDB data and have visited the project or took part in its training workshops in one way or another. But not just the CBDB, but also um, these platforms such as the uh, DocuSky platform um, uh, spearheaded by the uh, National Taiwan University um, or the Marcus text markup tool, um, European run. Um, for Chinese and Korean texts, especially pre-modern sources. These platforms have also sent trainers, have organized events with institutions in China. And also the use of social media, um, such as on WeChat. You know, that would be the go-to platform um, for Chinese researchers. Well, not only for academic exchanges, but for everything in everyday life, I would say. Um, and the chat groups there, um, amounting to up to almost 1,000 people, um, so this uh, uh, Zero One Lab, um, CJ and I are uh, among the co-founders. And the events, right, the talks, the uh, seminars, the lectures by visitors, um, DH is often seen as the showcase um, for some of the humanities departments and uh, faculties um, for innovativeness in the humanities. But the events are often not followed up with more investment of resources or staffing support. Uh, and um, especially the case of Hong Kong, you know, we see this in the case of Hong Kong. Um, for the sake of time, um, um, I won't go into the details, but uh, feel free to uh, ask me about this um, if you are interested. Basically, it's the problem with early uh, development, but later it's not followed up. So we have been lag lagging behind. Um, especially in the 2000s and the 2010s um, in Hong Kong. Reporting on recent updates, very quickly. Um, there are two regular journals um, uh, for DH research, and they feature many of the works uh, by students, by grad students and by faculty student collaborations, which is great, of course. And we also see some translations of the, sort of the classics in the field uh, from English into Chinese. Um, as well as uh, the development of some local, uh, locally honed uh, Chinese uh, scholars offered textbooks and anthologies. 
With the pandemic, international exchanges have been paused or even slowed down. Um, there are still some online events, of course, but we see a growing difficulty to create, further create and strengthen the institutional spaces that we have talked about. And one exception, uh, one rare exception would be the uh, uh, Renmin University of China, um, especially their iSchool, uh, because they, they uh, have not just a BA minor, but they also have set up a MA uh, in DH and a PhD program in DH. So this really um, is uh, going against uh, the current, you know, and so sort of really tackling the challenges head on. We do have more questions than conclusions, as I would say. What we are wondering is this. China as a latecomer to the DH paradigm, but as a source of so much demand for learning and teaching, faces many problems that might be familiar to you all in um, the room, in your respective contexts. Do you feel these are old challenges, or do you see that they are unique? DH is no longer the next big thing in China now. If anything, some already think it is the current big thing. But as for pedagogy, it hasn't taken root in the formal curriculum. That we can say for sure. So how do we sustain the informal and the formal spaces for teaching, as well as the resources for this sort of pedagogical effort, as well as the support that we need with that you know, um, question and sort of, uh, I will now uh, shut up and um, hand my time to our other panelists. Thank you. It's very interesting that when you were speaking, I was thinking of how many of those challenges are very similar, you know, even in my context here. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, thank you for being here. Uh, the title of our chapter for the book is called What is Postcolonial DH Pedagogy and What is it Doing in Non-Humanities Institutions? Uh, and as you can you know, recognize, that is from the seminal Matthew Kishenbaum's uh, essay in the beginning that what is digital humanities and what is it doing in English departments. So one of the things that we found, uh, both as digital humanities students and scholars, and later on as you know, a collective, the Dharti Collective, while we were trying to put together a DH community, was that in India, uh, digital humanities as an institutional structure or as an institutional program was primarily uh, developing faster at non-humanities institutions. And I'll tell you in a minute like what I mean by non-humanities uh, institution. It doesn't mean that they don't have humanities departments, but uh, I'll just, you know, I'll take you through that. So uh, what I would like to focus on today is you know just three, uh, a major part of our chapter is on case studies, so I will not go into those particular case studies, but I will tell you largely about uh, three different issues of digital humanities teaching and pedagogy in India, uh, the institutional challenges and the institutional setup, uh, the infrastructural uh, challenges and setup, and the intellectual, uh, you know, the uh, intellectual quandaries that we come across, right? So, uh, just like, you know, uh, uh, he was talking, you know, India is a big university system. And most of our universities are public universities. And right now, you know, uh, you can count about 384 um, uh, univers centrally funded universities. Uh, there are about, you know, uh, each of those universities have about between 150 to 200 colleges attached to them. And all of this is under a behemoth called the University Grants Commission, 
Right. And so, as you can imagine, the university system is vast. It is disparate so that, you know, the, uh, the curriculum, the quality, the access in one part of the country is very different from the same things in other parts of the country. And therefore, you know, a university grants commission has to really um, um, kind of take into account all of these differences, right? Which means that we end up with a very bureaucratic system so that if you have to offer a new course, a new program, uh, you need to go through a very circuitous route. Now, apart from these, so these are traditional universities as we understand universities, right? You know, you have different departments, you know, different uh, streams, uh, you know, very established disciplines, uh, and those disciplines are very turf-oriented, and people are very possessive about those turfs, <laughs> to put it mildly. Um, uh, and then apart from these, we have what are, uh, what, you know, the government of India has termed as institutes of national importance. And those institutes of national importance include the IITs, the IIMs, the Indian Institute of Science. Uh, these are basically what might, in some, you know, uh, uh, lose way be analogous to R1 universities in the US system, you know. So, uh, uh, so these institutes tend to be uh, autonomous. So you do not have the UGC sitting over them, right? And because of that, we have a lot more flexibility in developing new courses, new areas of study, and new research areas. Um, is, I'm not saying that it is, uh, you know, uh, it's easy, but it is certainly has to go through less bureaucratic paths. So the red tapeism is a little lesser. So if I have to offer a new course in my institute, IIT Indore, you know, I have to make sure that you know I have a curriculum, I have, and I have to defend it to my senate, the uh, the academic body that decides courses and programs. So that is why you will see, uh, unlike you know uh, digital humanities programs, uh, uh, especially in the Western world. Many of the DH programs have first come up in these institutes. Now, uh, as I said, I would explain, these institutes are not institutes that uh, uh, do not have humanities and social science departments. They all do. They all have very robust uh, humanities and social science departments. Uh, but they are you known for their technology department. So they're known for their engineering and the STEM fields. So Indian Institute of Technology is, you know, uh, uh, that is their USP, right? And so oftentimes, even within that system, uh, it was always hard for me at least to make the case that as a humanities faculty member in a, a department, I, I need funding, you know, I need money to some, do some projects because the assumption is, you know, we have a library and we buy books for that library, you know, what more do you need, right? <laughs> so, so that is, has been uh, the institutional challenges. So I know as someone who's worked, who's had the privilege of working in an IIT, how much more difficult it is for my colleagues in universities across the country. Now, having said that, I want to emphasize that when I say that in spite of all of these constraints, you will see, and we say, we lay it out in the chapter as well as in other, other works, that uh, there are some forms of digital humanities programs in many institutes in India now. And the reason sometimes that they are not enumerated as DH programs is precisely because of the bureaucratic tapism that I told you about. So you will see that people will include, say, you know, digital elements, digital tools into existing courses, into existing programs until they branch out to become, you know, independent programs of their own. So, and I think, you know, the, uh, the, the pace is frustrating but in some ways it has also led to very stable programs. So the ones that we have now are you know, fairly stable and fairly reliable programs across the country. So those are some of the um, institutional challenges. Uh, infrastructural challenges. So infrastructural challenges are of two kinds. One is uh, uh, literally infrastructures in terms of you know, access to uh, databases, access to journals, and you know, um, uh, access to digital platforms, 
the, uh, the time and the space to develop programs or to develop codes or uh, tools. Uh, and, uh, and that, you know, we are working through it, but yes, that, that is a ch huge challenge. But the larger challenge that I find, because I, I'll give you examples of people who have done things in spite of those challenges. The larger challenge has also been, you know, inter knowledge infrastructures, right? So now, when I am now thinking of starting a master's plus a PhD program in digital humanities at my institute, right, what are the texts and the theoretical um, vocabulary that I would be able to offer my students, right? And we have some great work out there which we constantly borrow from. But there is a, um, uh, there is a distance and a dissonance between the challenges and the problems that my students want to work with and, you know, the, um, uh, the theory and the vocabulary and, you know, the uh, um, uh, explanation that they may find in texts that are now available. So one of the first challenges that we felt was that we need to have books and uh, both textbooks as well as, you know, uh, writings on projects that are um, uh, originating uh, from their context, from the context of our students, right? And so that is what led to the first, one of the first books, I think, which says Exploring Digital Humanities in India, which is edited by my colleague, uh, Maya Dodd and Nidhi Kalra at uh, uh, Flame University in Pune. And uh, that actually is a primer for a student. So I have often used that book in my introduction to DH class. Right? And while using all these wonderful resources we have from the other, other parts of the world. Right? So we are now kind of, you know, in the process of writing a book called, you know, Do Learning by Practice which literally is a showcase of all the projects that have been developed with all of these institutional infrastructural challenges and how they did it, like, you know, what were, uh, what were some of the challenges. Right. So, uh, uh, so those, you know, building those knowledge infrastructures to me and to my colleagues is a very important thing for our journey in digital, uh, in DH pedagogy. Uh, so the third one, which I don't think I have time to go to in, in detail, but it's also, you know, training the, uh, training the faculty, especially at smaller universities in the hinterland, in other, you know, in the non-metropolitan places. Um, and uh, currently, you know, we now have a center for digital humanities and we are hoping to develop some of those programs in the coming couple of years. Uh, so those are kind of, you know, two uh, big challenges that we find in DH pedagogy in India. Uh, well, one, uh, uh, one that I missed uh, mentioning is, of course, you know, uh, material in languages other than India, uh, other than English. So, you know, uh, we are also looking to translate, uh, translate some of the books and see how we can, you know, reach that to communities uh, and how that might, um, uh, you know, how that might help our journey in DH pedagogy. And, you know, I was listening to some of our students who presented in a panel earlier today, uh, and they had done their own research and found that there are universities now that are offering undergraduate program, programs in DH. And I was listening to them and I was thinking that, oh, you know, I mean, that's a big commitment, you know, when you do an undergraduate program in digital humanities, you need a lot of things, and I'm not, I don't know, hopefully I'll know more about it. So, which means the enthusiasm is there, you know, the interest is there, both from the faculty as well as the students. The resources are still, you know, uh, uh, for asking, and we are hoping that, you know, that, that will get better and we'll work towards that. So, uh, uh, in a, through this chapter, you know, um, uh, we have tried to kind of uh, mark some of the intellectual uh, challenges that we have uh, in both articulating as well as disseminating, uh, you know, DH uh, thinking, pedagogy, and learning in, in India. And uh, uh, what we think is that the act of becoming a digital humanist in the Indian landscape for both research and pedagogy is primarily through acts of self-identification and not through previous affiliation to an existing big tent. Hence our reference to, like, you know, 
the departments. So it was really, it's not born out of departments, it's usually born out of, you know, intersection of, uh, of departments. Um, so, you know, what we wanted to underline that all of these factors, the governance structure, the funding, the culture of interdisciplinary research, often makes, you know, humanities departments uh, uh, for traditional humanities uh, departments very, very, uh, uh, you have to be really driven to have a DH program to actually do it. And it should not be that. It, that should not be the way that faculty have to function anywhere, right? Uh, so, uh, okay, I went through this. So post-colonial DH pedagogy that is characterized through its multiplicities, which make it inherently anti-genealogy, uh, and one that does not necessarily originate from a point, but comes from something bigger. Uh, pedagogical instances represent how the post-colonial DH pedagogy, at least with the Indian example that we show, resists a techno-positivist paradigm while emphasizing a decolonized curriculum. While overlaps will be observed between post-colonial and other contexts in the use of particular tools or platforms, we believe the positioning of that technology in the classroom creates a key measure of difference for post-colonial DH pedagogy, which cannot be reduced to classroom projects and practices. Uh, by challenging the binarism created between technological and humanistic paradigms, the Indian DH classroom becomes a site that provides details of what students and others might do together and the cultural politics such practices support. This aspirational model of critical pedagogy is central to the decolonized DH curricula envisioned in post-colonial uh, post spaces. So, you know, one of the things that, uh, uh, there was one point that I did want to make. Yeah, so with the, one of the things I do want to emphasize is that with an eye towards post-colonial digitality, which we define as the contextual realization of digital affordances in post-colonial spaces, we foreground that while post-colonial DH pedagogy in India can and should be many things, it should not be a checklist, a test, or, or another way to exclude people that major structural forces already exclude. And one of the examples of you know, practice of DH in classrooms in India I can uh, share is how easily uh, um, multilingual those classes are, right? So, you know, you often have a teacher, a professor, and a, uh, who, uh, and a classroom of, uh, you know, students who are very fluent in, in English, uh, students who, you know, are kind of, you know, get what we are saying, and then, you know, usually a bunch of students who have no who, this is their first interaction with the language, right? And so you will see the faculty kind of move between languages, take help from other students to kind of, you know. So these are ways in which it's always been part of our practice of teaching. And so how do we kind of ensure that the DH classroom not only incorporates that, but maybe then uses technology to kind of augment it and better it for that interaction. So that uh, is usually uh, one of our major, uh, major thoughts. One minute. Okay. And so I have run out of time. So uh, <laughs> I'm just going to read. read the book. Yes, the read the book. <laughs> so I'll just uh, conclude with uh, uh, our small conclusion, which I think is uh, nice. So in his essay, The Computational Turn, Thinking About the Digital Humanities, David Berry points out that computational technology has become the very condition and possibility required in order to think about many of the questions raised in the humanities today, unquote. Uh, Berry quotes Hofstadter's difference between intellect and intelligence and calls for digital intellect as opposed to digital intelligence. Uh, so for, uh, for Arab, for pedagogical DH at this point, means that we do a multitude of tasks that are intelligent, which we hope would lead to an intellectual vocabulary that will follow for Indian DH you know, in the coming years, both for research as well as for pedagogy. So we don't want to rush into a theoretical vocabulary because of all the challenges that I told you. The temptation to do that is there. But we do think that you know, it should come and it will come organically, and we should wait for that. And I'll answer questions afterwards. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 
so James O'Sullivan was unable to be with us. He, he had a preference that the paper be read live rather than over video. Um, and then Diane and I arm wrestled and I lost. And I've been told under no circumstance should I attempt a cork accent. So you'll get my, my plat American instead. So uh, James's paper is titled DH Pedagogy in Ireland as Neoliberal Logic or Social Opportunity. This paper asks our community to return to the essential question of pedagogy in the context of our discipline. To what end do we teach digital humanities? Back in 2016, writing about his experience teaching DH, Ryan Cordell argued that, quote, undergraduate students do not care about digital humanities, end quote. Most people in this room, most participants of this conference, as professional scholars and researchers, love to engage with the what is DH debate because it allows us to engage with the essential nature of what makes us relevant, what makes us digital, what makes us different. We also do it because those of us of a certain generation were at one point consumed with characterizing and defending, as Ramsey famously put it, the concrete instantiations of our discipline. And so consumed were we, and so consumed were we that many of us forgot that aside from professional academics, nobody really cares about the exchange of definitions with which we are so frequently engaged. As Cordell aptly puts it, quote, in DH classes, meta discussions about the field too often preclude engagement with its precursors and theoretical engagements, end quote. Which brings us back to the question first posed, what is the purpose of any DH program? What does it mean for a student to pursue and acquire qualification in the digital humanities? Why should students care about digital humanities? The creation of programs of any scope or sort should be motivated by a belief in the value of the thing being taught. The digital humanities are something, whether or not there are still some of us who don't agree what that is, most of us certainly now agree that DH is at least something. But there is a marked difference between disciplinarity as it exists within scholarly communities of practice and disciplinarity that is packaged into formal programs and delivered to learners. As teachers of DH, we need to consider matters of social relevance and responsibility before drawing learners into the culture of the field. If we don't know why we're DH, why it benefits our students beyond those who want our jobs, well then we shouldn't be teaching it at all. Nobody here will need to be convinced of the merits of a good education. Whatever education does for one's material prospects, we as educators can appreciate the intangible but rich benefits that one attains from formalized opportunities to learn. But beyond such intangible benefits, education should also be a vehicle for social mobility. Such an argument brings us to an uncomfortable place because it forces us to engage with language and perspectives we often try to ascribe to administration and management. But the reality is that what we teach has direct material consequences for the students who come under our tutelage. And so we have prof professional and moral imperatives to ask ourselves, what do we teach when we teach DH? This is particularly important in the digital humanities because DH has a class problem. This is not to say that other disciplines are immune from socioeconomic disparities, but that DH is a space in which students across all stages of education benefit from access to resources that would not normally be a necessity in the arts and humanities. To succeed in DH often requires privileged knowledge and resources, access to expensive equipment, software, expertise, and training networks that remain beyond the reach of many students and their institutions. Many students do not have access to computers capable of performing substantial analytics, or they attend institutions where licensed platforms commonplace in DH are not provided. Many students do not have access to digital libraries providing readings and data sets, or cannot afford the majority of the field's major publications, still in print and quite expensive. Many students do not have the resource to attend the field's many training networks, and many students in this age of remote learning and working do not even have sufficient bandwidth to engage with DH through web-based tools and communities. Education is always subject to the dynamics of class, but the humanities before the digital turn were at least a space through which social relations could be challenged relatively free of the cultural logic and resource requirements that heighten inequalities. When we teach DH, we risk bringing our discipline's failings into our lecture theaters and classrooms. So in teaching DH, 
Are we exacerbating problems of class and furthering the neoliberal logic that increasingly permits, permeates throughout society in institutes of higher education? A high profile example of DH being charged with contributing to this neoliberalization came in 2016 when Daniel Allington, Sarah Bouriette, and David Columbia penned a short political history of DH for the Los Angeles Review of Books. The central argument presented by the piece is that institutions and their administrators have emphatically embraced DH because it fortifies existing structures of power and allows traditional humanities disciplines to be stealthily effaced. Anyone teaching DH needs to confront the issues raised in this piece. We need to ask ourselves, what is the contribution of dedicated DH programs to the political structure of higher education? Does DH privilege pre-existing class structures wherein the best research the best departments and the best programs will be those with access to the capital necessary to do big, ambitious things with big, powerful computers. I don't have the answers to these questions, but what worries me further is I don't think our field, with some notable exceptions aside, wants to even have this discussion. And the reality is that if DH pedagogy is to create material socioeconomic opportunity for its students, it will need to do so within neoliberal contexts which will make many of its teachers uncomfortable. We must admit that many of our ideologies and methodologies are not always as progressive as we make out, or that the public social platforms we encourage students toward are right now often closed <coughs> hegemonizing spaces. By teaching computer-assisted approaches to criticism, we privilege metric-driven thinking, logic which does not always sit comfortably with humanistic ideals, and methodologies that are not always reproducible. But in recognizing such contradictions and failings, DH programs can turn, to some degree, the instruments of capitalism on themselves. Many DH graduates will be, smallowed by the, will be swallowed by the market through either choice or necessity, but others may well go on to eat a little part of it in the name of humanity. I appreciate the argument that this argument is defeatist in that I am suggesting we can, as educators, do little to protect the arts and humanities or halt the computer-driven endurance of neoliberalism. But teachers of DH can take comfort in two things. Firstly, many students of DH will find stable employment, and anyone uncomfortable with this justification can be grateful that they have never had to worry about the realities of selling their labor. Secondly, graduates who have studied computers through the lens of the arts and humanities, and vice versa, are precisely those graduates we want in future positions of power within the software industry. That second piece is more valuable than it may seem. Over a decade ago, Johanna Drucker argued that DH is an opportunity to reclaim the cultural authority of digital technology from the sciences and engineering. As teachers, we cannot free our students of pervasive public structures, but as teachers of DH, we can at least give our students the critical and sentimental training that one would expect of a degree in the arts and humanities, coupled with the techno-cultural fluencies they will need if they are to commodify their labor in the age of machines. Or as Ted Underwood puts it, we can prepare them to deal with monsters, a task which requires numbers as well as words. My usual approach to the intro to DH undergraduate course is to divide the syllabus into two sections. The first part is the navel gazing, where students do the tedious, but I still, perhaps mistakenly, think worthwhile, work of examining the disciplinary and community context from which the thing they are studying has emerged. At the very least, they are developing their critical thinking, arguably the most undervalued and effaced of skills in the neoliberal marketplace. The second part is dedicated to what they might see as the more practical side of affairs, what DH methods and platforms can do in applied and project-based context. In doing so, I'm trying to balance the importance of disciplinary history and critical reflection with the methodological utilitarian stuff that students can use to sell their labor. But synthesizing these two things does not mean that students get everything. It also means they lose a lot. Part of that loss is total immersion in those disciplines from which DH draws. Why are we teaching, to, to take one of many possible examples, computer-assisted literary criticism when one could take a proper, fully-fledged class in statistics and data analytics alongside their literary studies? Why bother with DH-specific programs when students can construct their own DH through joining existing offerings from departments of, say, English and computer science? That way, they get lots of both English and computing 
without any of the conceptually muddled baggage that DH brings. One response might be that DH-specific programs are inherently interdisciplinary and that teaching computational technique, techniques in conjunction with how they should be deployed specifically for humanistic inquiry makes students true adepts of distant reading as opposed to good readers who can also do data analytics. But, but perhaps we are wrong and what are we and what we are really producing are graduates who are neither readers nor technicians. Perhaps that is what we want to do because look, because look where reading and statistics taught in isolation has gotten us and maybe it's time for something else, whatever that may be. Perhaps interdisciplinarity is precisely what has made the world so precarious for so many young people. Graduates who fail to find secure opportunities for work in a market where specialist knowledge is a valuable com commodity. Or perhaps we are now in the age of the generalist, and there will soon be no work for anyone without an understanding of all codes, especially the digital. As you can tell, I do not pretend to have the answers to these questions, but as someone who believes in education as a force for socioeconomic and cultural opportunity, something which should and can serve all classes of society, I think it imperative that we continue to ask these questions of ourselves, our disciplines, and our pedagogical practices. At University College Cork, our undergraduates take credits from a carefully considered troika of disciplinary strands. They study programming and analytics in the School of Computer Science and Information Technology. They choose a minor subject in the arts and humanities from the College of Arts, Celtic Studies, and Social Sciences. And they take several core and elective modules from the Department of Digital Humanities designed to synthesize their technical and humanistic learning. This structure benefits greatly from sustained institutional support for the digital humanities at UCC, where the discipline has its own department, denominated degrees, and dedicated DH-centric staff. This means that students have four years in which to develop their critical thinking and technical skills, while also having a space in which to reflect on how all of this fits together as this thing called DH, and what that might mean, and where it might be useful in the wider world. They even do a year-long paid work placement, but that's a topic for another day. This model works, though it's by no means perfect. But it cannot be replicated everywhere in that institutions can't just found and fund dedicated DH departments and programs, though they should. But this model is no more immune than any from the questions posed in this paper. How will a particular DH program, however big or small, provide a real, not just intellectual, opportunity to its graduates? I suppose the tension to which I continually return as a teacher of DH is this. When we teach the digital humanities, are we engaging students with neoliberal logic or presenting them with socioeconomic opportunity? Or are we helping institutions to erode the arts and humanities, or are we giving, humanities and giving arts and humanities students the knowledge they need to survive in this grim digital world of ours? It's a sort of sad way to end, but there it is. <laughs> supposed to work. Let's hope. Amazing. I'm a trained art historian and we're always called to the front to do AV stuff, but I'm always still surprised when it works. Today, hello, uh, today I'm here to represent both myself, I'm Alison Langmead, and my colleague Annette V, who couldn't uh, join us here today. Hi, Annette. Um, and so I want to start by saying that everything I say about the way we structured the course and put it together is a definite we and not I. But then I veer off topic and talk about some other stuff that um, uh, I'm not going to say whether Annette agrees with me or not. You can ask her. But really, that's more of an I than a we. So um, uh, uh, I don't want to speak for both of us on that. But on the setup, I know that we agree. So if you read our contribution, this is the title of our contribution to, the, to uh, Diane and uh, Brian's uh, 
edited volume here. I'm going to talk today a little bit about teaching DH to a broad undergraduate population. I myself actually um, direct and maintain our PhD level DH courses um, uh, called Digital Studies and Methods uh, at Pitt. But when I teach undergraduates um, in, in the Digital Studies and Methods domain, it's often through this class that we teach called Digital Humanity. And when Nanette and I designed this uh, a bunch of years back, we thought to ourselves, what is the way that we want to introduce digital computing to our undergraduate population, both as an object of inquiry in and of itself and as a method they could use to do their interpretive work? And the way that we wanted to go about it, of course, was to, to, to talk to the largest number of people possible. To do that at Pitt, which has a very, very strong pre-med um, population, um, I, it's, it's something like 80% of the folks that are, come into Pitt think they're going to be pre-med and it doesn't work out for all of them. Um, how are we to actually get them to hear us about not only the humanities, but also about the impact that digital computing is having on them? And so we went back a, a little bit to some historical documents about the founding of the United States um, National Endowments for the Arts and the Humanities, and we became very enamored of the following um, two points of view here. One of which, this is Glenn Seaborg, um, the head at the time of the Atomic Energy Commission, um, in the hearings that started um, the US NEH and NEA. And, and he makes this distinction. Science and technology, he said, are providing us with the means to travel swiftly. You're imagining the space race. You're imagining the 60s, um, certainly in the States. But the question is, where, how are we going to actually use this method? What, is, how, what course are we going to take? And of course, this is the question that no computer can answer. He asserts, um, I, now myself, assert that in between 1965 and 2023, we've actually lost our way about this distinction, um, allowing computation to do a lot more of the judgment work that belongs in the human domain rather than just the reckoning work that they do. Um, but this is one of the things we take up in the class. The actual founding documents of the NEH say this. An advanced civilization must not limit its efforts to science and technology alone, but must give full value and support to the other great branches of scholarly and, culturally act and cultural activity in order to achieve a better understanding of the past, a better analysis of the present, and a better view of the future. And this is exactly the mandate we try to bring to digital humanity. <clears throat> We want to represent the core concerns of the humanities, using digital computing as our content, but then also asking students to use computing to, to um, express, publish, and sometimes even analyze their own uh, findings. We want more than just answers. The computer's gonna go ding, right? We want more than just answers from them. What we want is to hear them come up with good questions. These are the process questions rather than the product-focused um, uh, modes of our inquiry. This is what the humanities are. Um, we are many things, but one of the things we are is question askers. One of the things we are, are um, is are the fields that allow us to consider the way that human beings could have been other. Grappling with these interpretive processes is incredibly different work, it's difficult work. And the fact of the matter is, I, Allison, Annette can agree or not, feel that actually the concept and the, the, the content of digital computing, the history of digital computing, working with digital computers, serves as an almost too perfect foil for humans to understand better what we are. As we, as, we, as we see other people mechanize what it means to be human, to actually sit down and figure out how that's, to use our president's phrase, malarkey, can help us better understand ourselves better than, than almost anything else. And this is because, as a catchphrase of this course becomes throughout the entire 16 weeks of a, of a term in the United States, computers are human all the way down. We started them. We made them, we program them, we use them, we accept them. There's nothing magic in these machines that we didn't put there. And that makes it an essential topic for the humanities, one that we try to put in front of as many students as we can. So this is the hard question. We ask humans, ask questions that no computer can answer. How is that and why? It's a philosophical question. So good news, the gen ed that digital humanity fulfills is philosophy. Believe it or not, we teach a DH class that's actually um, a philosophy class. Easy as pie. Um, uh, pie the dessert, not the number. Easy as pie. Um, the fact of the matter is that, as everybody in this room probably knows, computers are built on the notion of a logical truth table, right? All the way down, it's philosophy. 
<clears throat> I, Allison, am on a rampage. Eh, that's too strong a word. I would like to stop using the phrase critical thinking in my own work. I think critical thinking hides a multitude of sins. I actually don't think it means anything, and I'm a little bit suspicious it masks the white supremacy. And the thing about it is that um, everybody all knows what it is, but nobody can quite tell you in words what it is. And so, I, at least I can't all the time. And so I've been trying to figure out ways to do this. And digital humanity is an excellent opportunity for me to express better what it is that I have and always meant about um, critical thinking skills. And, and, and that's up here on the screen, which is this. How are we to imagine alternative futures? How can we take a present that we can see and describe and actually imagine how it might be other? And this is what, and students, I don't know about y'all students, but my students struggle with this. Why? It's not because they're lazy or dumb or anything you want to do generationally horrible about it. It's because they often are not asked to do it. And it's an incredibly difficult thing to do. And we spend time in this class asking people to use computers and not treat them as something that has always already been there, but as something we made and that could, could ostensibly be removed, not in a sort of revolutionary way, but what would it be like other? Sure, sometimes they look at me as a Gen Xer and say, whatever, boomer. And I'm like, that's fine. Whatever it takes to get you guys to see that the, the, the actual privilege and joy of being a human is to be able to imagine alternatives, to be able to imagine another future, to actually be in charge of one's own um, engagement with the world. <clears throat> so for example, discussions. ChatGPT is a big con. The more we talk about technologies as something that's, that are separate from our humanity, it's reading, it's writing, it's thinking, the computer is something other, the more we actually functionally make that happen. This is a good example of the kind of thing that the students are asked to think through. The interface, I'm not even going to get mad about it, and that's going to be so proud of me. <clears throat> what gets me about ChatGPT is not the model, it's the interface. That interface is a con. And it makes me so angry every time a student says, well, it's typing at me. It isn't typing at anything, right? And yet the whole, the whole sort of the, the skeuomorphisms of the way it's presented and the way that we externalize it as a thought process, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm through, I'm done, I'm not going to rant. You're welcome in that. All right. So, <clears throat> briefly, since we're all here as pedagogues and since you'd like to hear something practical apart from my ranting, I'd like to tell you how it worked out with the role of general education requirements. In the United States, as elsewhere, I'm sure, um, our students are um, asked to have majors. But then there's distribution requirements that go across the math, science, and humanities field. And um, really, the majors are so intensive right now that if your class, no matter, frankly, no matter what field, if you're trying to draw from across the university, if your class is not listed as a gen ed, it will not fill. Right? So this is actually a, 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 the, one of the reasons that we started um, it this way, is that we wanted to get as many people as possible. And the way to do that is to attach to a gen ed. And so we attached to philosophy. And we were very happy um, at the time to be given basically a small grant from our Honors College to start it up as a small scale um, seminar for eight eight or 10 students, and we tried out all the different sort of bells and whistles of both producing things digitally and trying to get students to think mindfully about computing as a practice, and it was great. They were great, everything was great. We, we opened it up to 50 people in year two. It filled in 30 minutes. <clears throat> Each year we sort of um, opened it up to more and more. We started to build a following. Um, the Greek system really liked this class, not sure why, so we got a lot of folks in from the sororities and the fraternities, that was great. Um, these are the ways that um, people sort of learned about this class. And then as the courses became more popular, we actually also ended up being able to instantiate different majors and certificates. So my graduate um, DSAM, Digital Studies and Message Certificate, has an undergraduate parallel, which hopefully will start up soon. And we were able to start, um, through the English department, a whole major with Sky, our School of Computing and Information, called Digital Narrative and Interactive Design. And for both of those curricular initiatives, digital humanity became a gateway. So, this leads me to the perils of success. Because Dina, the, the major, went from zero to, to like 60 in, um, it, was, it was launched during COVID, and I think there's something like 150 majors, it's not in my purview, so sorry Jess, I forgot that wrong. It's something like 150 majors from zero to 150 in something like two years. That's a lot for Pitt. 
And um, that means that these, um, these classes that, we, with, that Annette and I started, as you can tell, with a great deal of inter interdisciplinary interest and intrigue between ourselves, now has to be taught to all of these students. And so now it's not just Annette and me being able to teach it to 50 students um, gloriously. I, I think it runs at maybe four or five sections a term now, filling up with 50, with 50 folks in it. And that means more than just Annette and I teach it, right? And so maintaining the consistency, and I don't mean this like the teachers don't have agency, but when five teachers teach one course and there isn't a set curriculum, it, it varies as we go across. And so these are the perils of success we're sort of thinking through right now. Um, we still, we love teaching this class and the class needs to go on, but what's the balance that we need to strike? between something that started as sort of um, a labor of love for two um, friends, frankly, that now needs to become institutionalized. So here's some other lessons learned. <clears throat> and actually, this is, the, this is the slide that I heard three times. <laughs> Um, Annette is in the, I don't know if I said this, I'm jointly appointed at Pitt between the School of Computing and Information and the Department of History of Art and Architecture. And Annette actually runs our composition program in the English department. We're, um, that's not the farthest distance in the humanities as you can get, but this is a resolutely interdisciplinary idea. And um, so we do history stuff and we do composition stuff and, and we do visual culture stuff all in, all in and when we teach digital humanity. But the fact of the matter in, is then that if we didn't have the gen ed, no department would want to own this class, right? It's, and who, is gonna, who schedules the class is actually becoming quite the, intellect, uh, quite the administrative hurdle as Pitt cuts back on its staff and cuts back on its staff and cuts back on its staff. Something tells me that also hit a nerve, right? It's, it's not quite clear who actually is responsible for telling the registrar it runs that this class is going to go. Um, so, fundamentally, I leave, this, I leave one of the things with, with you guys is that it's probably not going to work exactly the same way at Pitt, but if you're going to start DH classes that are resolutely interdisciplinary, which um, I believe that they need to be, the, um, you need to find, you need to hitch your wagon to the rising interdisciplinary star. What is it in your, in your institution that's actually going to support interdisciplinary work? Because if you're not hitched to that, it's a really, it's a sustainability red flag, as my other project would say. Finally here, <clears throat> then here is the sort of larger scale question, one that I'm always um, uh, happy to end on, which is that this is all fine and good. Interdisciplinary is um, the only way I wanna work. You learn more than you, you, you feel like you learn more than you teach and everybody leaves with that idea. But in the neoliberal logic that James was mentioning, Brian James was mentioning in the, in the last paper, this also has a quality of um, always forever growth that's associated with it. And the question is, what are these interdisciplinary um, um, majors and certificates um, in DH going to build up to? And if they're not going to build up to something like another discipline, right, which would be beyond ironic, what is it actually that we're trying to instantiate here? An always middle ground where you're always a generalist or you're not quite specialist enough or you can't get a job here, you don't look enough like a computer scientist, you don't look enough like an art historian. This is really a big challenge, not in defining DH, but ensuring that we're aligning our core values and missions and goals as humanists and as humanists who see the importance and value the importance of digital technologies to just being human in 2023. How do we align that in the system of control that we are all um, uh, subject to? Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Um, so there are several joys in, uh, in uh, editing a, a, a collected volume like this, and uh, I just got to experience some of those in real time. Uh, the first is that, it, especially if you're editing a Debates in DH volume or, or working in one, it's, we're encouraged by Matt and Lauren, Matt Gold and Lauren Klein, to collaborate in, within the writing of the volume. So a lot of the authors were writing against and within and uh, other example um, with each other's work and then began citing one another's work. Another of the joys is working with Brian. Another of the joys is actually um, how we got to watch the work of our authors evolve over the last four years, five years. And in fact, um, what you just expressed um, 
just struck me that your very first versions of these essays, you've come so far. And, it, and just not that the essays came so far, but your experiences have come so far. And I think it's really important to stress the fact that the pedagogical experiences of all of us, of all of you, have, have transformed profoundly in the last five, 10 years. So it's so exciting to see that as something that continues to evolve and thrive. Um, housekeeping, uh, we have people who have been listening online and we have people who want to hear online and also one another. So if anyone has any questions, you'll see um, there's that cute little orange um, square thing. Um, so please, if you would ask our, our authors and, and panelists questions, raise your hand and they'll come to you with the orange square thing. Yeah, up here. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was a wonderful panel, so thank you for all the contributions. Um, I wanted to ask about something that I haven't really heard about and might be a bit practical in a sense. But so my experience of teaching DH style you know, courses, um, part of it is also that the workflow seems to be very different. So I mean, for example, if you use software like Python or R, if you run into a problem, then you go to Stack Overflow or something like that. And that is not really something that seems to be very common in, in other types of courses that we teach. Also, that flow doesn't seem to very well fit within the infrastructures that we have. So I was kind of, so I was just wondering, like, how do you approach that or how would you reflect on that? Is it on? Oh. Uh, before I answer your question, I just want to make a small uh, this that the when I ran out of time at the end, I panicked a bit. But the we I was measuring to throughout my talk is me and my colleague, uh, Dr. Dibyadyuti Roy at the University of Leeds, who could not be here in person. So I just wanted to say that. Now to your question, uh, I, you know, I agree with you. Uh, the way we do it in the DH courses in my institute is that we have a course credit structure that is called LTP, which is lecture, tutorial, and practicals. Right? So we ensure that the DH courses are always you know, four credits, which is divided between lecture and uh, practical. Right? So which means for every one hour of lecture, you have two hours of uh, practical work. Right. And so there is like, you know, we do Python for humanities, for example. So then we have some hands-on uh, you know, time with sometimes, you know, postdocs or TAs, maybe not the faculty member, but that's how we divide it equally. Yeah, sure. Um, we don't teach a lot of um, R or Python in this class, but um, it's, a, it's a three credit hour class and we do something similar. There's a, it's divided into three 50 minute sections. So we actually run recitation, which actually could parallel better the way CS runs its class. Two, two lectures, you know, two lecture type, but then one that's actually recitation. But what I really want to say, of course, is something abstract, because it wouldn't be me if it weren't abstract, which is that one of the things about Stack Overflow and that workflow model is that I actually think there's call for us to say it's not any different. It's the exact same as looking something up in a book, right? You're going to a trusted community and you're looking for specific pieces of information. I would emphasize continuity over difference is what I'm saying. Yes, the mechanisms by which you do it are different and your trust value might be different, but really humanists have always been embedded in, a, in, a, in an entire community of like-minded people who were trying to help each other build new knowledge. And so I would probably emphasize continuity over difference. Um, there's, there's a hand in the middle and they're flailing. Wait, whatever you, keep going. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I really like Alison's approach. So, so you know, seeing, seeing the, um, the rest of the world through, through the humanities, you know, integrating it, uh, seeing co continuities. Um, but I wonder how that ties into the discussion about interdisciplinarity. And so it's also a question to the Chinese colleague, I, I think, this colleague from China. Um, so, isn't it, should it be inherent to the humanities to incorporate the digital rather than seeing interdisciplinarity as something that is a problem or that's something that should be achieved? 
I mean, why look for support outside the humanities? Why not uh, re-educate the humanities to deal with the digital, to learn, you know, what was mentioned just now, Python and R? Because then you will be able to argue uh, uh, with the colleagues from, from the STEM disciplines from a position of strength. And, you know, there's a lot of talk about the neoliber neoliberalism as, as, you know, it's, it's kind of an American framing, I think. It's not one I'm necessarily used to, although I'm from the Netherlands. You see the discussion there as well. It's Anglo-American. It's Anglo-American, okay. And neoliberalism, neoliber this definition is a bad thing. Uh, okay. Um, but, but you can, you know, take a position of power if you take the step and stop you know, speaking from a kind of inferiority position, which I think is doing, not doing the humanities any good. I hope my question is clear, right? So, for, uh, specifically interdisciplinarity. Why not integrate the digital into yourself rather than find, looking for the solution into something, uh, in something that's interdisciplinary, whatever that means? It's a question, I think, to both of you. Do you have one I mean, I, I just... I Yeah, thanks for the questions. Um, yeah, we talked a lot about the disciplinary and the interdisciplinary uh, solutions uh, to Chinese academia because we used to have some cases for the interdisciplinary studies, which is uh, female studies, gender studies, and cultural studies. Something happened before, but unfortunately, it wasn't that successful because it's so hard to cross the discipline. Especially for the digital humanities, uh, we had a discussion many times to talk about how to define uh, digital humanities in Chinese context. But we, at the end, we think it's the better way is not defining it because we want to leave some space to people to use digital humanities as an uh, outcome or even the excuse for them to do something cannot be existing in their own disciplines, which means we want to give students or faculties more opportunity to go out from their boxes to find them more, even for some students from the engineering department or from the science, they never saw someday they could take some courses, you know, just let them to connect the engineering or computer science to humanities by themselves. So I would say uh, from the constructive way of research for faculties, we would like to have some really concrete or detailed description or methods for interdisciplinary research. But for the teaching part, I think it's a better way to keep it more flexible or just blurry or not that accurate, you know, to define maybe it's a by the way. So that's just a thinking. Yeah, I'm not sure if that answers the question, but yeah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> We're not in a position of one down, right? It isn't that the humanities aren't in the position of one down. And the neoliberal logic here, I'll define it as I use it, is that the students are under so much pressure to specialize and know exactly the one thing and be incredibly legible to one field that it can be very difficult to get them even to hear you. So, in the, so let me give you an example. So let me talk about your a traditional computer science major at Pitt, right? So I'm not even talking about all of the states. I'm just talking about my home institution. And a traditional English major or an art history major. The challenge of digital humanity is in part to convince the computer science folks that the computer can't answer all the questions and that the proxy conditions that they're producing is actually changing our humanity. At the same time, we're demonstrating to the English major or the art history major that they're continued, and again, I'm saying this as a generalization, and this may not be the case in the Netherlands, but the English student's not gonna know why they need to know code. They'll resist it actively. And so this class is also there to open the door because you and I both know how long it takes to get to actually fluency in R, right? It's not something you can do in a term or, or Python, right? It's something you develop, frankly, over a lifetime, yeah? So the goal of this class isn't to place us in one down or one up. It's actually to do this work, which, I don't know, I mean, it, it, let's just say the top 5% 
are getting it anyway, is to demonstrate the limits of computational flexibility to those who think it's an infinitely generalizable resource, at the same time demonstrating to those who either have a fear or a resistance or a desire not to do that sort of stuff why it's still important to know enough to have the conversation, to engage. And many of those students then go on to gain skills because the door was opened. I'm just going to speak very quickly about my own university, Brigham Young. We've had a program in our College of Humanities for the past 10 years or so aimed at the humanities students that was called Humanities Plus, encouraging students who want to major in language, in literature, uh, study of art, to take courses outside of the College of Humanities to add a, some competencies to things. But we've had a reverse effort called Plus Humanities in which we've tried to market to students across the university to come and take a class or two uh, from our college, that it, it's, uh, it's a thing they're welcome to do and that it will benefit them in their thinking. Uh, and sort of relatedly, in our digital humanities program, we had for quite a while a lot of people coming from the CS department to take our classes because we were the only place on campus that taught Python. Um, and the CS department recently changed everything and so now they're, the Python is their primary language. But for a while, it was, you could only learn Python at our university if you came to the, the weirdos um, in the language building. And so there are, there are I agree with Allison, like we're not going to, to win these fights, but if we give people the, the tools to think about, out, out, to think algorithmically and to think uh, in a way that some portion of the workforce works, that, then we've done our students a great service. Other questions? Yes. Box, box coming. The box. Hi. Uh, another question from the Netherlands. Um, actually, I found the title of your whole session quite misleading. Uh, it asks what we teach when we teach uh, digital humanities. Well, actually, you were discussing the struggle to get any teaching in place. Eh? So the institutional. Uh, struggles, and I very well understand, and we are in a super privileged situation where uh, digital humanities education is supported by universities, by faculties, by the government, etc. Still, I would like to ask the participants, uh, especially from China and from India, so what actually do you want to teach and, and why? Eh? Why, what, what is, what, okay, you just said it's no longer the big thing, apparently. So it's, it seems to be something about politics that you wanted to do this. Or is there another really important reason why you want to teach digital humanities? Uh, so that, that's my question. You want to go? F I should go first. Okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, actually, I didn't get the time to talk about, like, you know, the content of, of these courses. Uh, but at least, you know, uh, my, the courses that I teach and some of the courses that I know that my colleagues in DH, in different institutions in India teach, uh, there are some challenges of, un of humanities and technology in India that are very unique to that space, right? And so uh, we teach them, for example, using OCR, right? And, you know, uh, using that with texts and manuscripts that are written in uh, Devnagari, Arabic or Persian scripts, and see, like, you know, how that OCR really translates. And I'll tell you right now that, you know, for example, in India, uh, except for a couple of maybe two or three languages, the OCR accuracy is still very low. So then I teach my students that, you know, this is a skill we need. So whether they are engineering students or they are humanities students, you know, and I have both students take my classes, right, that we need this. So can a literature or a language student, uh, a PhD student, for example, work with a PhD student in computer science and see how you can better the, uh, you know, better the corpus. In other, you know, in some other example would be building corpuses, right, building databases uh, for, say, you know, literature scholarship in languages other than uh, English in India. 
and you know archival work you know we have amazing collectives in india you know uh, and those are done by a group of passionate people building an archive but they themselves can't take it forward right so how do you make it sustainable and growing in the coming years so you know teach them that there are these areas which need skills that require both critical thinking as well as you know um, not necessarily coding per se but an understanding of you know computational and uh, uh, software skills that might be necessary so whether you do it collaboratively collectively or individually these are the problems and can we you know can we train them to think about these problems and think about solving them and uh, and i think it's quite encouraging at least from my experience so i hope that answers some of you yeah so uh, I can't speak for other Chinese scholars, but I only can talk about my experiences. So Alice, Alison mentioned about a philosophical, you know, question like why we want to teach uh, digital humanities for the undergrad students or graduate students. I think firstly because I have faith in digital humanities. Like a teacher, if you don't believe in what you are, you know, doing that's difficult for teaching. So that's something I've learned for many years because I jumped from the media studies to digital humanities and I found it's very, not just useful, but very important. So that's why Lincoln and I started thinking about, you know, maybe we should set up something for the students to make them understand while we start our own career. And then that would be really good for them. Secondly, I think a student definitely can learn something from the teaching. In the past, uh, like, how many years? Eight? Yeah, yeah almost eight, seven or eight years, I saw many students really learn a lot of things from our class. Uh, not just the courses, but also the online courses, lectures, and workshop, even, you know, with very flexible ways, not that systematic. But still, they learned a lot, and many students actually changed their directions for the graduate students, uh, graduate studies. So that's also, I think, it's a good way to think about uh, uh, what we can teach. So we just change our uh, course plan or the, even the references every year. And thirdly, I think it's also the new pedagogy in a way to teach something because for our university we never had a course like uh, um, having uh, having having the faculties from the four or five departments to teach one course so we just set up the different model like uh, courses for uh, for the students so students can learn a lot of things you know just in one semester and also it's a, like a project-driven you know, course. So students can really make something. They can just build up a project or website or something very funny they cannot do in their own department. So I saw something out from the teaching, so I, that's also a, another motive for me to keep, you know, continue. Uh. Okay. I think we have time for one last question. Were no last questions. Oh, oh where? There's a like wave your arms. There. I just can't see. Yes, thank you. Uh, I think this is, would be a quick question. <laughs> uh, from the perspective of creating uh, not the course but the program of studies like bachelor, a master, or PhD studies in digital humanities, do you think this is uh, even possible to create something like a core, like a basics, what exactly we should teach uh, on the every level, like bachelor, master, and PhD? Uh, because I know that there are more and more uh, programs like that and uh, maybe it would be even easier to convince the authorities of the university because you said that this is a big problem to open the new course. If there will be like international um, basics for every, uh, you know, digital humanities uh, program on the each level, uh, if, is it even possible or maybe it's not? <laughs> Thank you. 
Should I go? <laughs> um, well, I, you know, uh, when I design a course in TH, I have this template, which for me has kind of become a standard template when I think about it. When I divide it into three sections called tools, text, theory. You know, in that order. Right. So uh, what I do is like, you know, well actually the first and two are, one and two are more interchangeable, but the theory comes last, right? And so, you know, you kind of, in, depending on the level, so, you know, I have mostly taught only masters and PhD students, so I do it a little different for both of them, but, you know, introduce them to some of the simple tools, the easy ones, and get them kind of eased into that and then look at some of the text, the, uh, you know, the text that can go with it, you know, discuss it, and then look at some of the theory that is out there in the field and then have those discussions. So I kind of do it like that, but there is still not a standard tools kit that we can refer to. Like, you know, you have the toolkit for theory. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think a toolkit for DH would be a good, <laughs> uh, would be a good uh, idea. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Uh, just a quick point to add to now that we are in Europe. Um, I just wanted to plug the uh, DH course registry um, yep. uh, run by uh, Daria, uh, Claren Daria, um, and that would of course um, obviously be a great starting point. Yeah, that's a great place to end um, and a great place to start. Uh, thank you very much to our panelists once again. If you'd give them a big hand of applause. Thank you for coming and have a wonderful rest of the conference.